Yeah. Okay. So we're delighted that we have with us um, Dr. Thomas John Hastings um, for delivering the CCCW Day lecture today. Dr. Hastings is the director of the Overseas Ministry Studies Center at Provincial Theological Seminary. He has spent more than 25 years um, as a missionary and educationalist in Japan and has lectured in several uh, institutions and he has traveled to several parts of the world and lectured in several institutions all over the world. It gives me a great honor to welcome him on behalf of the center and on behalf of all of you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Today he will speak to us about the life and work of Kagawa Toyohiko, one of the earliest reverse missionaries from Japan to the West. Today Dr. Hastings is joined by his wife uh, Mrs. Carol Hastings with us today and uh, we are very glad to have you with us and thank you very much for joining and a warm welcome to you. Um, let me say a few words about the CCCW day before handing over to uh, Dr. Hastings. As some of you already know, the Cambridge Center for Christianity Worldwide exists and works in the memory of Henry Martin, a great missionary from Cambridge to India and Persia. The Henry Martin Trust was set up in 1881 on the first birth centenary of Martin and it inspired and encouraged Cambridge University students about world mission for several decades. In 1992, the trust appointed an inaugural lecturer in missiology in the Cambridge Theological Federation. It was Bishop Graham Kings, who then was Canon Kings, who is with us today, who founded the Henry Martin Centre. On 22nd January 1996, he officially opened the Hindu Martin Library for the study of mission and world Christianity, having moved it from the Hindu Martin Hall to the Westminster College where we are gathering today. In 2014, the Hindu Martin Center was renamed the Cambridge Center for Christianity Worldwide. And since 2021, we have been celebrating this day. And this year, uh, we, we are celebrating with the lecture delivered to us. Um, by Dr. Hastings. And it's also um, an annual, we also usually go on this day, an annual gathering uh, in person and online of the friends of the uh, center. Before I uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Hastings, just um, uh, um, one thing about our forthcoming uh, you know, two events. Uh, so we have our regular um, terminal lectures uh, at the Divinity Faculty, and we have the next one coming on the 1st February. Uh, given by Dr. Um, Hannah Briscoe on the missionary children and the development of Rwanda mission. The other one is um, our second World Christianity Summer Institute here in um, uh, Cambridge. It will happen in July um, 2023 and here is a, um, a flyer which is available to you and also it is available online. You are very welcome to publicize these events and, and participate uh, in them. With that, um, towards now I hand over uh, to Dr. Hastings to deliver the Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, first of all, with sincere thanks to Director Dr. Mujaraj Swami and Bishop Graham Kings for the invitation. Uh, and also to Rachel Simonson and Dr. Pa Pavlina Kaspar Kasparova, I want to congratulate you, uh, who are the friends of the CCCW, the Cambridge Center for Christianity Worldwide, as you celebrate CCCW Day and your 27th anniversary. This is wonderful to be here with you, to see Cambridge, and to meet friends old and new, and uh, looking forward uh, to engaging with you, uh, also those of you who are online, engaging with you around the subject at hand, uh, who is Kagawa Toyohiko. Now you may have seen his name uh, rendered as Toyohiko Kagawa, 
which is the Western way or the American way of rendering the name. However, uh, in deference to the Japanese culture, I put his family name first, so I call him Kagawa Toyohiko, which is the proper way uh, Japanese would understand him. Any American who attended an ecumenical Protestant church between 1925 and 1960 almost certainly would have heard of Kagawa Toyohiko. And though I'm not so sure about the UK, the same would be true in Protestant churches in Europe and Oceania. Considering just the American case, a keyword search of Kagawa's name yields an astonishing 114 hits in the New York Times online, ar online archive, and a search of the limited archive of the Christian century from 1940 until his death in 1960, yields 35, me 35 hits, articles that mention or were written by the once renowned Japanese evangelist, social reformer, writer, and Nobel Prize nominee, twice for literature and four times for the Peace Prize. Focusing on how the American churches made use of Kagawa for their own purposes, David King rightly characterizes Kagawa as, quote, a hero received and shaped through a particular Western lens. The biographies that appeared during his lifetime were mostly hagiographic, in part because Kagawa's story helped justify the Western mission enterprise. And certainly, also, because there was something in this Japanese spiritual exemplar that these mostly missionary biographers felt lacking in their own lives of faith. Whatever their value as historiography, these biographies reflect an honest sense of wonder or puzzlement about the ministry of a non-Western Christian whose influence reached far beyond the churches and schools of theology. Nevertheless, in spite of his meteoric rise to fame during his own lifetime, which I'll talk about later. After his death in 1960, Kagawa was quickly forgotten by churches in Japan and in the United States and elsewhere. In Japan today, it's very interesting that he continues to be remembered and revered mostly by those outside of the churches. For example, by the leaders of the consumer cooperative movement that he had launched in the 1920s. So my talk today is going to have three parts. The first, I'll focus on Kagawa's childhood, youth, conversion, and the sudden rise to fame. The second part will be about the Kagawa phenomenon, with special reference to his 1936 speaking tour in the West and I'll focus on the American uh, story because I have more documentation from the American side than I have from Europe. He went all around the world. And the third part, I will talk about some, of, I'll just touch on some of the multiple dimensions of Kagawa's thought, which is related to the reasons he's been forgotten. So, without further ado, just to give you a sense of, um, who he was, I think it's always helpful to see a person's face as their face evolves over time. So there we see Kagawa as a middle school boy in 1902, and then Meiji Gakuin, uh, where he went to study theology, and then he transferred to Kobe seminar, Seminary. Uh, then he went and did something very dramatic by moving into the slums on Christmas Eve. In 1909, and there he is with uh, the children uh, of the Shinkawa slum. Uh, then he got married with somebody who was who became his co-worker for life, Haru, uh, 1913. Oddly, he ended up on the steps of one of the houses at Princeton Theological Seminary when he was a student in 1915. Uh, you can see him there down on the lower step. He's the only non-white uh, person in that uh, picture. Uh, then he uh, became famous and he was rather philosophically minded, so this is for uh, some cameraman uh, posing in his study. 
And then the U.S. tour in 1936. Uh, before and after the war, uh, you'd be surprised to learn that this photo here is actually before the war, and that's after the war, uh, and he, that's only five years. Uh, he aged significantly, and then as an elder statesman. So those are some photographs which will come up again later on. So let's look first at his childhood youth and uh, sudden rise to fame. Uh, first of all, uh, Cagallo was born into unusual circumstances. His father was a merchant and a government official, and he had a legal wife and a concubine. So Cagallo was the son of uh, uh, Kame, uh, Kame, who's uh, here uh, pictured, and this is his father, Junichi. Uh, and that was something that he had to live with for his whole life. Now, this was not at all unusual among the elite classes in Japan at the time, but he was the child of a concubine. And unfortunately, uh, and this has a big influence on Kagawa's later life, he loses both of his parents in succession. First, his father dies in November, and then his mother dies in January in 19, uh, 1893 and 1894, and he is sent back to the family home where he lives with his father's legal wife. Now just imagine that situation. I don't think she was too happy to welcome him uh, back into the family fold, but thankfully there was a grandmother, that is uh, his father's legal wife's mother, who took him under his wing and nurtured him as best she could. So he lived here and he basically was nurtured by living outside. Uh, in the uh, surrounding agricultural area, which was near a very beautiful river, and he became fascinated by fish, birds, and other living things. Uh, and this is a very significant part of Kagawa's life. Now, I won't go into an analysis of what it means to lose both of your parents when you're that young, but you can well imagine a lot of people never recover from such traumas, double traumas. One of the interesting uh, parts of Kagawa's training as a child is while he was uh, going to elementary school, his grandmother, who wanted him to be an elite inher inheritor of the family fortune, uh, sent him to a local Zen temple to study the Confucian classics. This was the last generation of young Japanese elite boys who studied the Confucian classics. Before Kagawa, this was very common, but he was the last one to study the Kangaku. And this made Kagawa uh, quite unusual among his peers. And he was not happy about going to study the Confucian classics. As a matter of fact, uh, he felt jealous of his schoolmates who were going off to play after school. He had to go and study this under this very strict regimen in a Buddhist temple. There he is as a young uh, junior high school student uh, in Tokushima. And one tragedy after another, he developed uh, tuberculosis uh, in 1901 when he was 13 years old. And this was a disease that stuck with him and became a chronic uh, problem over the next several years. But you can see uh, his, his young, innocent, and rather handsome, but somewhat sad face. And he was very interested in studying English. And in those days, there were missionaries who were present and willing to give English lessons to anyone who was uh, really interested. So he met these Presbyterian missionaries, Harry Myers and uh, Charles Logan, and Harry Myers uh, baptized Kagawa in 1904. Well, I will talk about that later. Uh, but later on in life, Kagawa looks back on his conversion and his baptism. And this is interesting uh, what he says. Uh, and the particular scripture reference uh, he, he mentions here. As a child, I was thrilled by the Shinto teaching that when men die, they become miniature gods. But what a long period of waiting, no possibility of becoming a son of God until after death. And when I contemplated the tragic world that these men become gods had left behind them, my soul was filled with un unutterable sadness. 
An urge to study English led me to Dr. Meyer's Bible class. In this study, I came upon Luke 20, 12, 27. Consider the lilies, they neither toil nor spin. You know the verse uh, from the gospel. Through this verse, I made the momentous discovery that the love of God enfolds this universe. It filled me with joy. Now I awoke to the tremendous truth that instead of becoming a little God after death, I was here and now a son of the God of all the earth, the creator and ruler of this vast universe. And this God is my father, the God of love, who wipes away my tears, saves me from sorrow and from my, the sins hidden in my soul. The fact that Christ revealed the love of God by his exam example of his life completely captured me. With high and holy resolve, I dedicated myself to translating his cross-revealing love into present-day life. Now that's looking back after a long life, which we'll find out more about. And you'll find out what he's talking about. Uh, about a year after his conversion, he wrote a very interesting article called Arming Crabs. Um, uh, and expressing no sense of tension between Christian faith, his newly found Christian faith, and evolution. That was a, a fight in which he had no um, interest. He had no dog in that fight, we would say in America. In other words, this was not confusing to him in any way. Uh, science had revealed uh, something to Charles Darwin and his successors. So why not take that on board? But he did wonder, and he's a junior high school student writing about this, and he did a rather uh, a thorough analysis of these crabs that he found in the river near his home. And he wondered about what he sees as Darwin's overemphasis on survival of the fittest. And he wonders why we should not also take account of the evolution of altruism, altruistic love among human beings. So, yeah, he was willing to admit that survival of the fittest is indeed um, a reality. But what about altruism when we find it? And occasionally we do experience it and we see it among human beings. And I would say not just among human beings. We see it among human beings and their relationship with pets and all that kind of thing. And pets, vice versa, give it back. So I won't go off on a tangent, but I could. Altruistic love is a question. How do we account for that using Darwin's theory? That was a question he had as a junior high school student. Uh, then he was sent with the help of missionaries to attend Meiji Gakuin, uh, which was the Presbyterian College uh, in Tokyo. And he went, went to study theology, uh, and his family opposed this move, but uh, he went anyway. And Dr. Reischauer, and this is Dr. August Carl Reischauer, uh, who was a missionary, Presbyterian missionary, and his son, Edwin O. Reischauer, was John F. Kennedy's uh, um, ambassador to Japan. So this is a very elite American missionary family, and Reischauer says he was the most brilliant student he had ever taught, and uh, Robert Speer mentions that. Uh, Robert Speer, of course, was a Presbyterian uh, mission board leader. And the Spear Library at Princeton Seminary was named after Robert Spear. Here's a list of the books of Kagawa, that Kagawa was reading. Uh, actually, there's a legend uh, that Kagawa read all of the books in the Meiji Hakuin Library. Highly uh, spurious, to say the least, but he was a voracious reader across a range of disciplines. We see Augustine's Confessions. We see uh, Engels and Marx. We see uh, Victor Hugo's uh, biography, uh, world history, Chinese history, uh, David Hume, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he was a voracious reader across a range of disciplines. He was not just interested in theology, which is which is important um, to mention. Uh, he fell under the influence of Christian socialists in Japan, and while he was uh, home on the summer vacation. He wrote and published his first published piece, which was called On World Peace. And this is a rather sophisticated, for a, a theology, a, B, a BD student, um, this is a rather sophisticated uh, article that was published in the Mainichi uh, newspaper in uh, 1906. 
Uh, unfortunately, it is not in English, but I, I read through it and it's a bit pedantic, you might say. It quotes all the right sources, but we're not sure exactly what Kabbalah thinks yet. So, t typical student, he's, he's trying to digest all the reading he's doing. Okay, now, uh, he actually fell uh, again ill, uh, and he went back to the Kobe Theological School uh, because his, his spiritual father, um, uh, Harry Logan, was transferred there, and there he is at the Kobe Theological School. Now, Meiji Gakuin was not a liberal school, per se, but it was more liberal than the Kobe Theological School. And today, the Kobe Theological School is a very conservative, reformed Presbyterian seminary in Japan, a very small one, um, whereas Meiji Gakuin later on became part of Tokyo Union Theological Seminary, etc. So there he is, um, and his, his TB worsens, and he has a, a very um, um, tragic kind of experience where he almost dies. But he's, he writes about this and, he's, and he said, the doctor was disappointed because he had pretty much written out his death certificate. <laughs> and when he uh, actually survived, the doctor was very confused. And Kagawa said, I forgot to die. <laughs> I forgot to die, is a funny thing to say. But during that time, he had this overwhelming sense of the presence of God, um, and he didn't quite know what to make of it. And it wasn't easy to unpack when you have that kind of experience when you're so young. But he did something which is quite unusual in the history of Christianity. It's very unusual in the history of Christianity in Japan. Uh, it's the only case I know of. I'm not sure about England. I can't find a similar case in the United States. But he left his dormitory at the Kobe Theological School, packed all his things, and he went down and he lived in the slums. You see, part of the assignment for students at Kobe Theological School was to go to preach on the streets. Street preaching used to be part of the theological training. You know, that would seem, uh, you know, um, ridiculous today in our theological schools, but it was part of the testing, you might say. And Kagawa was down on the street preaching about God's love, etc., and he kept hearing this echo, the echo of the, his words, God is love, God is love, and then he'd go back to his comfortable dormitory, and he couldn't live with himself. So he did something rather dramatic, and scholars uh, since then have tried to unpack what he was doing. Was this a suicidal move because he knew that you know his life was threatened by TB? Was he just you know basically going into the slum to give his last to the people there? You know we don't know. We don't know. Uh, he doesn't really say too much about it. But what we can say is this changed uh, Kagawa's life forever. And it also changed Japanese uh, Christianity forever. And I would even say it changed the history of 20th century Japan. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there, so I'm going to show you a few slides of Kagawa in the slums. Uh, it, it was not a nice place. It was really the worst slum, the worst place that you could possibly live. And uh, But he had this sense of calling to not just talk about God's love, but to actually demonstrate God's love. And he develops this over time into practicing the redemptive love of God in Jesus Christ. That's a phrase that he uses over and over again. Practicing the redemptive love of God in Jesus Christ. Now that's a bit of a challenge for those of us who are Presbyterian. <laughs> but there he is, a Presbyterian living in the slums. Okay. Uh, he marries Haru in uh, 1913, and she basically agrees to his program. And he pretty much said, please don't sign up for this unless you're willing to do this, you know, because uh, this is going to be a tough life. And she signed up. And actually, Haru is equally engaged in the work going forward, from this day forward, from the day they uh, um, are married. And Haru has been neglected by scholarship, not surprising, 
right? Uh, but thankfully, there are some Japanese uh, women scholars who are finally looking seriously at Hadu's letters and other documents to get a greater sense of what her involvement was. And I, I actually interviewed uh, Kagawa's oldest daughter, who's still alive, and uh, I interviewed her when she was 89. She's still working as a doctor in a hospital that Kagawa founded. And she is a really quite remarkable person. But I asked, I asked her about this. I said, well, wasn't your father traveling all the time? And she said, absolutely. Uh, Mom took care of the house, period. And all of the projects that Kagawa had started, which you're going to find out about in a minute. So here she is caring for the children in Shinkawa slum. They like to take the children on outings because as he had experienced, he believed they had to get out of the smoky air pollution uh, and uh, go out into the countryside, breathe, see the uh, birds, see the uh, trees. Um, play in the rivers, etc. And so that was part of their program of education. And then he suddenly uh, has this opportunity. He was pretty burnt out after uh, several years living in the slum, as you can well imagine. And the stories that he tells about living in the slum are not uh, all pleasant by any means. This is not an easy uh, kind of task. He wrote, he wrote a book uh, of poetry about living in the slum, and um, you can, you can, uh, I can give you the reference for that later if you're interested. But now he goes on a ship to the United States to study theology again, thanks to the missionary support, and he ends up at my alma mater and where OMSC is now located, Princeton Theological Seminary. There he is in the Calvin Club, right there. And there he is on the steps of one of the professor's homes, and that's his um, BDIV. Now, while he attended Princeton Theological Seminary, the president of the seminary, Ross Stevenson, gave him special permission to take as many courses as he wanted at the university. There was no reciprocity between the seminary and the university yet. But Kagawa was interested in philosophy, psychology, and natural science. So he took, and mathematics, and he took all of these courses at the university, not receiving a degree at the university, but he had a special dispensation from the president of the seminary. And uh, his time in Princeton was very significant. And this will surprise some of you who know a little bit about Princeton theology and Princeton history. This, of course, is B.B. Warfield. Kagawa took a course in 1915 with E.B. Warfield on evolution and its theological applications and effects. Now, uh, I didn't realize this until I uh, came upon uh, the article by Mark Knoll and David Livingstone, uh, but they write that one of the best kept secrets in American intellectual history is that E.D. Warfield, the foremost modern defender of the theological theologically conservative doctrine of the inerrancy of the Bible was also an evolutionist. Now, this is before the fundamentalist, modernist uh, rift, which the American churches still have not gotten over in the 1920s. This is 1915. And B.B. Uh, Warfield's father was actually a farmer and um, raising uh, cattle and other animals. And B.B. Warfield himself thought about becoming uh, a farmer, but he was, he was able to look at the life of animals firsthand and realize that maybe Darwin was really an agnostic, not an atheist, as his predecessor Charles Hodge had called Darwin. Charles Hodge had written, this is really important in American theological history, Charles Hodge had written Darwin off as an atheist, which meant that a lot of people followed suit in that opinion. B.B. Warfield seriously tempered that opinion, and he said that actually Darwin was an agnostic. I think that's very interesting. And for those who are interested, there's, there's a theological rationale for B.B. Warfield's uh, understanding, uh, which I'll skip over just now. While Kagawa was studying at Princeton, his wife was studying at Yokohama uh, Kyoizu Egakuin, and um, there she is 
Um, and there she is right here. So this was, he didn't just leave her in the slums, thankfully. Uh, that could have happened, but it didn't happen, thankfully. Okay. Now, when he returned from this uh, two years of study in, uh, in the United States, several opportunities presented themselves. Uh, he could have gone and taught at several different Christian colleges or theological schools. And he had one goal only, and that was to return to the slums. That is difficult to understand, let's face it. That's an anomaly. That's like a second time going into the slums when you have options. Uh, but that's actually what happened. And he stayed there from 1917 until 1923 with Haru. And in, in the United States, he had become familiar with the labor movement, and he had seen strikes in New York City. And uh, he thought, oh, we need to organize the labor, the workers uh, in Japan because they're being really severely exploited by the steel companies, Kawasaki, Mitsubishi, and uh, which were located in Kobe. And so he led a Christian labor movement uh, called UI Kai with Bunji Suzuki. But Kagawa was a Christian socialist, but he was a gradualist. He was not a radical. He didn't believe in violence, and he didn't believe in uh, revolutionary change. He believed in gradual change, and you'll see the, uh, the reasons for that uh, in a minute. Now we come to a very important event in Kagawa's early life, which has an impact on the rest of his life. Imagine, up until now, Kagawa has been living basically in obscurity. Very few people knew about him. And certainly, John Mackay, who was the late, who later to become, uh, and a Scotsman, who was later to become the president of Princeton Seminary, was in the same class as Kagawa, and later on they became great friends, but he didn't remember Kagawa as a student. Maybe that's because he was at the university all the time. But the point is, Kagawa was really under the radar until this publication of a novel, which is an autobiographical novel. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit. Chronicling his anguished childhood, teenage baptism, and dramatic decision to follow Christ by moving into Kobe's worst slum, his 1920 semi-autobiographical Shisen no Koite seized the imagination of an entire generation of young Japanese readers, becoming the single most best-selling novel of the Taisho era and the first novel in Japan to ever sell more than a million copies. Imagine that happening to you. What would you do? Just think about that and hold that thought for a moment. Just as the novel was catapulting Kagawa to fame far beyond the tiny minority Japanese Protestant movement, he and his vision for the spiritual and social reform of Japan came under attack by some church leaders. Uh, Congregational church leader Ebina Danjo uh, and new, newly elected president of Doshisha University declared, quote, the reason the slums have not disappeared in spite of so many years of Kagawa's efforts is because his project is half-hearted. Kagawa countered Ebina's cutting accusation, showing no deference for the respected church elder, who was 32 years older than he, saying, quote, the slums have not disappeared because there has been nothing but criticism with few offering a helping hand. If public opinion was aroused and the row houses reformed, the slums would disappear immediately. And he writes, he concludes, I am happy because my staying here for so long has made people who have never given this a single thought think about the slums for the first time. Now, I mentioned earlier that he liked to use the term practicing the redemptive love of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about what that means, but let's just put it this way. He was really um, willing to throw everything in for this project that he had. Throw it all in to give it all, which few of us are re ready to do, actually. Let's be honest. That's why he was such a fascinating figure. But on the other hand, 
Kanawha was far from perfect. I'm not rewriting a hagiography here. Later on, another Doshi Shao professor, uh, Miki Ovakada, um, whose family had worked closely with Kagawa in the 1930s, said, because of Kagawa's strong sense of mission, he could appear arrogant from time to time. So when he had an idea and he was going to pursue it, don't get in my way. That was his thing. Now, again, imagine what you would do if suddenly you wrote a book that brought in this level of royalties. And when I say this level, in today's American dollars, it would be $3.5 million. So <laughs> there he is, living in the slum, giving witness, helping children, you know, starting these little businesses. He actually started a match factory, for example, that lit on fire <laughs> and burned down. He had, many fit, he had many fits and starts in his ministry, but he was always on the move, and he was always motivating other people to start things. He would give them the idea, and off they would run. Well, here's the shocker. Um, Kagawa took the uh, money from the... Um, you can see this chart. You can't read it because it's in Japanese. I apologize that, that I didn't uh, translate it. Uh, but he took the, the royalties and he put it into all of these projects which he had started. This is like uh, this is like a workers' struggle fund. Nihon no yohi. So this is this is for farmers. So he was giving all of this money to these different projects which he had launched. Uh, and that's um, how he did it. Now imagine how the church leaders who had questioned his sincerity um, uh, of his domestic mission uh, may have been baffled by this decision, not to buy a big house for himself or his children, but to put it into all of these projects. Yes, um, this happened. Now, turning briefly, uh, by the way, this is, uh, he started a medical clinic, and even before the medical clinic, even before the novel, he found a doctor, Majima Sensei, uh, who was willing to come and volunteer with him. He was inspiring a small group of young Japanese before the novel, but when the novel hit, he was getting visitors from all over Japan. <coughs> Suddenly, went from obscurity to overnight fame. And it wasn't long before uh, he turned from the labor movement uh, to starting a co-op. And he realized that he couldn't just be about the business of saving souls. He actually had to do something to change the social conditions for the people living in the slums. And so he had this idea from, of the co-op. This, he started the co-op in Kobe in 1920. This is one of the largest food co-ops in the world with 1.2 million members. Uh, Carol and I were members when we were in Kobe, actually. And there, there it is in the original days, and there it is today. Where did he get these ideas? Well, he got them from Great Britain. He got them from the Rochdale Weavers. I'm sure you've heard of them. I hope you've heard of them. Uh, Robert Owen, Welsh social uh, reformer and founder of the so-called father of the cooperative movement, uh, was one of the inspirations for Kagawa's cooperative economics. Kagawa was trying to find a mediating path between monopoly capitalism, which was very strong in Japan, and communism. He was, as a Christian socialist, he was trying to find an economic theory that would mediate between these two extremes. And he found it in cooperative economics, and uh, the novel uh, made him famous in Japan. And then in 1924, it was translated into um, uh, English. And um, the following year, uh, W.B. Yeats, you may, have, you may remember, Irish poet, uh, praised Kagawa's bestseller, uh, saying, quote, I have read Toyohiko Kagawa's novel. 
translated into English under the, under the title Before the Dawn, and find it about the most moving account of a modern saint that I have met. Okay, so this is the early life of Kagawa, and we won't go through that because we already have. And as well as, in addition to launching the co-op movement, he started what you would call today a parachurch organization. Uh, he felt that his colleagues needed a little spiritual help. Not all of them were committed to the church. They loved the idea of uh, practicing the redemptive love of Jesus. That was really um, uh, attractive. But the churches were not always welcoming to Kagawa's band of friends. That's another side of it. So, and another thing to say about Kagawa that, is, that puts him in a different category than the other Japanese church leaders. Kagawa, after the novel, suddenly became very uh, well known and quite wealthy. And the funding that he was beginning to receive from the United States did not have to be uh, mediated or adjudicated by the mission boards in Japan. It went directly into his own accounts, you see. So he had a, a route for foreign um, uh, income that could circumvent the missionaries. He was close to many of the missionaries, but he was also an equal with them. So this is a very, this puts him in a different position because until, until World War II, uh, more than half of the Japanese Protestant churches were still receiving funding from overseas. Kagawa was receiving funding from overseas, but it went directly into his own accounts for his projects. Okay, so that makes him very different. But he is worried about the spiritual life and he comes up with these five principles, which is a very, uh, kind of an aggregate of uh, Roman Catholic and um, uh, Wesleyan thinking, but uh, seek piety and Jesus love work and befriend the poor, strive for world peace, value uh, lifestyle of purity, and make social service your principle. And he described this as a Francisco Jesuit Protestant order. <laughs> okay, that's very an anomalous too, and a bit offensive to the J Japanese Protestant church leaders of the day. What is he doing, you know, drawing the spiritual resources from the Catholic tradition? How dare he, that young, impudent upstart? You see what I mean? So um, they had a, um, a spiritual support too. Now, I had mentioned earlier that um, Kagawa appears in the New York Times. And this is the first article uh, in the New York Times of over 124 articles. Powerful spiritual leaders wake Japan from materialism. Um, this is in 1923. Uh, the novel has not yet been published, but this um, uh, writer, um, I forget his name, Gardner or something or other, um, this writer came, ac came across Kagawa. They knew he was bec becoming famous in Japan. Uh, and when Bertrand Russell uh, went to Japan, Kagawa translated for him. Remember, he had studied at Princeton Seminary. He was fairly good in English, although some people didn't think so. Uh, and then when Einstein came to Japan, he wanted to meet this Kagawa chap. So you see what's happening to Kagawa? He goes from being basically a nobody to being a rock star, if you will, in other terms. Then in 1920, uh, 1923 in September, uh, Tokyo area experiences a huge earthquake and Kagawa gets on the boat the next day from Kobe and he goes to Tokyo and he volunteers and then the Japanese government actually enlists his help to lead relief efforts. So now he's in Tokyo doing relief work. At the same time of all this other work, Remember the co-op, the spiritual movement, the relief work. Now he is um, engaged in rural evangelism. A lot of the farmers uh, he met could not read Japanese. So they first needed literacy training. And so he started these rural gospel schools. It was not like, it was not evangelism 
uh, D.L. Moody or um, you know Billy Sunday style evangelism. It was much more cautious and um, sensitive to the local people. It was really what you might call contextual mission. That's what he's doing in Japan. And that's because a lot of the missionaries didn't want to go to the rural areas. Okay, but there he... And the Japanese pastors, who had been trained in Kobe and Tokyo and Osaka, etc., didn't want to go into the rural areas. That's still the case today. In 1924, he makes a trip to the United States, which is a precursor to the one I'll talk about momentarily, and I'm going to speed up now. So stick with me. Um, oh, one thing. Kagawa cooperators in America. His group of supporters in America is growing, and specifically, Japanese Americans, uh, what we call Nisei, uh, second generation Japanese Americans, were in love with Kagawa. They saw him uh, as an exemplar of evangelism and social reform. And those two weren't going together too well in these days. So Kagawa, again, has this unique approach, evangelism and social reform. It's not like opposites, not siloed. Um, so there he goes off to America. This is the uh, First Congregational Church in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, which is a, a Japanese American church, full house. But an important event happened in 1924, which you may not know about, which is the passage of the Immigration Act. Um, Chinese were not able to become citizens uh, in the United States at, up until this time. But now the United States government decided to add Koreans and Japanese to the list. So East Asians were not, not able to become citizens of the United States. And specifically, when uh, the U.S. Senate passed the uh, Immigration Act of 1924, uh, Kagawa became incensed by this because he knew both countries. And the missionaries, interestingly enough, spoke out against this. Not all of the missionaries, I should say. Uh, several of the missionaries spoke out against the Immigration Act. But let me just read this quickly. The post-World War I Wilsonian moment caused some American missionaries to rethink their assumptions about American cultural superiority, leading them to adopt a more sympathetic and cooperative stance toward the peoples of the non-Western countries to which they were sent. They expressed their newfound anti-imperialist and anti-racist position by opposing anti-Asian agitation, agitation on the West Coast and calling for the repeal of the exclusionary 1924 Immigration Act. Because of such political views, many missionaries came to embrace Kagawa as an exam exemplar of their Christian internationalist vision. This is uh, from a dissertation at Yale University uh, by the Chinese Japanese uh, uh, 2019, beautifully written. Uh, Imperial Pacifism is the name of the book that's coming up at the University of Hawaii Press soon. If you're interested in this, it's a fascinating read. Did beautiful research. Uh, but Kagawa had some very strong words about the Exclusion Act. They didn't call it the Immigration Act, they called it the Exclusion Act. You see, you can change, you understand. By the recent Exclusion Act of the United States, the Japanese as a whole have found that the United States is no longer a Christian nation. In the spring of last year, they were alarmed that the United States was acting to exclude Japanese from our territory. And they were sorry to find, find out that the spirit of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln does not abide in the hearts of the United States citizens. America today is only a land of liberty for the white race. It is no more a land of liberty for the yellow race. In the future, we Japanese must discriminate between two kinds of people in America, namely those who are Christians and those who uphold the principles of senators. While we uphold the principles of senators, we can never have a world republic. Warfare will continue between races. Hatred will be more powerful than goodwill. We must arm and must be prepared to fight each other. We shall need more and more armaments against enemies. We shall not be able to believe in our neighbors. We shall repeat again the tra tragedy of the great wars. And civilization and culture will be destroyed over and over again. Look at the whole continent of Asia. Japan is the only nation which has independence, and the whole of Asia is under white man's control. That's an interesting comment. Though the white races believe in Christianity, they are not believing in true Christianity. Their Christianity is only in words. 
The Sermon on the Mount has never been practiced, and now the throws you all in too, by the European nations. Now that's Kagawa in 1925. Uh, how to win friends and influence people? Right. But look what he says there in 1925. And think of the subsequent history. I'm not saying that he could foresee the history, but he did realize um, the tragedy that was uh, potentially going to unfold. Um, this is 1925, another New York Times article, Christian Socialist Stirs All Japan. And now we finally come to his visit in 1936, after J Japan has invaded China and uh, set up the puppet state of Manchukuo, Manchuria. Um, this is Kagawa speaking to a crowd of 7,000 in Iowa City, Iowa. Now, Iowa City is not a huge town. There's a university there. Um, but he could get a crowd any place now. So the Kagawa phenomenon is just going crazy. I'm going to read a little bit. Kagawa's 1936 tour of the United States was a clear success in numbers, organization, and publicity. He appeared in 150 cities and towns over six months, from San Diego to Maine, Birmingham to Seattle, Lubbock to Duluth, often speaking three or four times a day in a single city. Perhaps 750,000 Americans attended his addresses, and others heard him on the radio, with huge numbers in some urban centers, according to local newspapers or correspondents. 20,000 in both Boston and Chicago, 12,000 in Philadelphia, 9,000 in Memphis, 7,000 in Louisville, 7,500 in St. Louis, Kagawa appeared at seven events in Seattle over two days. 5,000 people heard him at four events in New York City on a single day, with thousands more on other days. I know you're feeling tired. His college appearances were impressive in both attendance and diversity, addressing 1,200 students at Columbia University and 1,500 students at all black Tennessee Agricultural and Industrial College. A highlight of the tour was the invitation to Kagawa by Colgate Rochester Divinity School to deliver the prestigious Walter Rauschenberg Bush Lectures, named for the leading figure of the progressive era social gospel movement. This, by the way, is from Robert Schaefer. Kagawa spoke in small towns as well, with three presentations on March 8th in Bel Air, Ohio, at a high school, for example. So, um, suddenly, uh, as I mentioned at the opening, Kagawa is very well known. Christian Century is writing weekly almost, I guess, bi, bi, bi weekly on Kagawa. Uh, one rabbi in uh, Rochester, New York, uh, told his congregation if we were to search the entire world for a Christian whose life most nearly approximates that of the founder of their religion, I could find no finer example than Kagawa. So he's getting praise from all quarters, if you will. Okay. He has two purposes, uh, to evangelize and also to preach the gospel of cooperative economics. This is during the Depression in the United States. A lot of unemployed people and a lot of capitalist uh, exploitation, even after the, uh, we entered the uh, Depression and a lot of laborers um, who are mad about this. So he doesn't want to stir up the anger and wrath of the laborers, but what he wants to do is offer this cooperative uh, economics as a kind of a solution. Oh, by the way, he stops over at Princeton Seminary to see uh, Ross Stevenson, President Ross Stevenson, and uh, his former professor, Charles Erdman, and his books are being translated into English. Look at this. Marketing, one of his novels, a Grain of Wheat, in 1936 to accompany the tour. This guy's on the road. He's being pushed by the Federation, the National Federation of Churches, which became the NCC, uh, National Council of Churches, later. He's being amplified by many of the leading newspapers. 
people are in love with Kabbalah, especially the educated elite, so-called, in the Protestant world. Now, having said that, he was also trailed by certain American fundamentalists who were noting his heresies on a daily basis and publishing them in their own uh, journals as well. So, uh, Kagao was not just uh, beloved, he was also attacked. Uh, these are a few of his books in other languages, translated. And he met his old um, mentor, Harry Myers, and mentors Harry Myers and Charles Logan. That's Kagao in the middle of the back. Uh, this is the lectures. Uh, this is worth reading, actually. Uh, it's a very idealistic uh, view of uh, history. He takes, he takes a lot from John Ruskin um, and uh, Robert Owen, and he has a very idealized view of the medieval guild. Uh, and if you've read John Ruskin, you know what I mean when I say that. Christian Brotherhood and Economic Reconstruction. Okay, Reinhold Niebuhr, who's a little hesitant about Kagawa, but positive about co-ops, writes a pretty scathing critique of Kagawa for this reason. Kagawa went too far with cooperatives, making the cooperative movement into a panacea and, quote, a distinctively Christian method of achieving a new social order without conflict. And Reinhold Niebuhr was kind of the father of critical realism in American theology. Uh, he was actually very liberal in his politics and was involved in workers' rights movements and co-ops, etc. But he wondered how Kagawa uh, would socialize giant corporations like U.S. Steel, Chase National Bank, and the Pennsylvania Railroad. Good question. Niebuhr knew of no examples in history, and he said there's not a shred of evidence that cooperatives could accomplish what Kagawa claimed. But then he said, Kagawa had come to America in its hour of confusion as, quote, a messenger from the other side of the world. Perhaps distance lends enchantment. So you can hear a biting critique there, but then Niebuhr meets Kagawa at Union Seminary, and he's quite impressed, but still um, there's this lingering question. Kagawa is a little too idealistic. Now, I don't have time to go into the reasons for Kagawa's idealism, but based on what I've said thus far, I think you can see how he has a goal, he has a calling, he's going to pursue it, and anybody who gets in his way is going to be um, thrown under the bus. <laughs> and uh, yet, there are other voices. Another graduate of Princeton Seminary, um, whose name was Francis J. Grimke, class of 1878, Kagawa Senior, Kagawa's class of 1916, he was a well-known African-American church leader and pastor of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church in Washington. He expressed great admiration for Kagawa. So you see, Niebuhr on the one hand is criticizing Kagawa for the economic theory, but Grimke is expressing admiration. Let's hear why. Here's what Grimke wrote in 1936. Here is a man of another race that in the qualities that go up go to make up greatness of the highest order is without a superior anywhere. On this highest plane of noble character in life, this man, a Japanese, stands and challenges the attention of the world. As this man moves about, as he lives his simple, beautiful, self-sacrificing life of love, he is a standing rebuke to race prejudice and all narrowness and bigotry based on race or color everywhere. So, again, you have Niebuhr, you have all of Kagawa's supporters, and there are many. Then you have the fundamentalists who are quite critical of Kagawa's theology. And then you have uh, people like Grimke, who see Kagawa as really a very significant rebuke to the deep racism of our society, which is an interesting thing to ponder. 
and something else. Uh, I'm just, I know I'm a little bit, um, we have till 5.30 and I want to leave uh, some serious time for questions. So if you could just give me a few more minutes to rush through a few highlights on what went into his thinking and you know what are the sources of his inspiration, um, if you will. Okay. Now, this is a familiar image to some of you uh, from the Pali Canon, which is a Buddhist sutra, uh, an ancient uh, writing. This is elephant that's being looked at from all these different angles. And each person who's looking at the elephant thinks they understand the elephant. They're actually only looking at one part of the elephant. Some are looking at the trunk, some are looking at the tail, some are looking at the body, etc., etc. Et okay. Kagawa is very interesting because because of his training in, um, actually in Buddhism and in Confucianism, he wants to see things as interrelated. He's not happy with the way that we have parsed things out so clearly. He wants to try to see things whole, if you will. And I wrote a book with this title, uh, Seeing All Things Whole, which is about Kagawa's basically his intellectual biography, and especially his interest in science and faith. But here's what he says at the bottom. When we open the eye of the Kokoro, we see that the cosmos is not such a bad place. When this eye that sees all things whole turns only toward external realities, it does not see. But it does see when it turns simultaneously towards internal realities. That is, when the Kokoro focuses on the whole cosmos, Cosmos, we understand. Well, that sounds a little new agey, so I'm going to have to unpack that for you. What is he talking about? What is he actually talking about? Um, well, I, I, I do need to just mention this real briefly. Um, so, Kagawa was concerned that in modern world, Science has given us many gifts, but one of the problems that science has engendered is our inability to see purpose that is intrinsic to the natural world. Okay, that is intrinsic to the natural world. So anticipating the work of people like Louis Dupree or Bruno Latour and others, Kagawa was worried about a view of nature that could no longer discern any tables, any purpose in nature. Okay? You understand that? Okay. No purpose. He looked around in Japan at the society that he lived in, and he felt that there was a great deal of nihilism. And whereas Japanese society was, and culture was taking on scientific, um, insights and doing wonderful science already. Leading science. Actually, one of uh, Einstein's friends was um, Hideki Yukawa at Tokyo University. I mean, there are many leading Japanese scientists at this point. But he worried that science had, and this goes back to Francis Bacon and others, science Hobbes, this, this, this idea that Nature itself is completely um, erratic and it has no end, no purpose. So, appealing to the masses with little knowledge of Christian faith, Kagawa believed that a positive religio aesthetic interpretation of nature and science was a key missiological concern in Japan. And he reasoned that a faith, faith that is rooted in the canonic movement of incarnation and self-giving must strongly support the scientific quest. That's a very, I, I, I can buy that. The incarnation means that this matters, stuff matters, material matters. And so we have to look at it seriously. He doesn't, he's not just trying to find, you know, God in nature. He's not trying to do that. It's not natural theology exactly, which makes it hard to understand if you read it, what he's actually writing. He was a voracious reader of science and especially biology, and he argues for directionality, or what he calls initial purpose, in the long, painful cosmic journey 
from matter to life to consciousness or mind. Through an anti-reductionistic a posteriori methodological pluralism that sought to see all things whole, this scientific mystic employed Christian, Buddhist, Neo-Confucian, personalist, and vitalist ideas to envision complementary roles for science and religion in modern society. Um, a Catholic scholar, uh, Hideshi uh, um, uh, Kishi, wrote about Kagawa uh, that Kagawa and T.I. Beishadan had a lot in common. He wrote an article in the Christian Century in English. Um, now, I'm not saying that Kagawa and T.I. Beishadan can see the world the same way. Neither of them knew of each other, by the way. But um, Kishi writes, for Kagawa, evolution has a direction that moves toward a purpose. What is the purpose? Well, the complexity, again, quote, the complexity that occurs within selection, that is, the complexity of selection, generates a movement from matter to life and from life to consciousness. Well, what does that actually mean? It's a very uh, circumscribed teleology that he is offering here. He talks about initial purpose. He's not talking about ultimate purpose. And he's not using nature as a proof for God as a former natural theology did, and still tries to do sometimes. Uh, I'm going to have to skip over this. I may come back to it in a question and answer. But um, Kagawa and Martin Luther King Jr. were influenced by the same school uh, of philosophy. So I'm going to skip ahead to his last book, 1958, Cosmic Purpose. Uh, that's how we've translated it. Uchinomo uh, Kateki, and we translated it and published it in 1915. It is the most bizarre book um, that I've ever um, read in, in some ways. And he's not, as I said, he's not trying to use nature as a proof for God. But what he's trying to do in the post-war era is to awaken in the Japanese people uh, another way to look at the world besides nihilism and purposeless um, casualism, where everything is just accident. And what he says about the universe is very simple and quite circumspect. There is purpose in the cosmos, right? that's his thesis, and this is what he sees as a purpose. Cosmic purpose is directed towards life. This is from Cosmic Purpose. Purpose of life is directed toward mind, consciousness, and the, I'm reading a lot of uh, books about what consciousness actually means these days, and there's a lot of theory among scientists and philosophers. So, but he's just taking consciousness as a given. Um, individual mind is social, directed towards construction or building. Social mind oriented toward construction is en route to historical evolutionary development and awakening to cosmic consciousness. And what he means by that is by able, being able to see all things whole. Even if nature looks like it's purposeless, the fact that we can look at nature and understand it, and the fact that human beings are so such a recent arrival here, and all of these different facts um, make for, uh, 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 give a, a strong case for religious people to take science very seriously. A lot of uh, conservative Christians in Japan were writing off science, thanks to Charles Hodge and others like him um, and their successors. And then he says, this orientation awaits the assistance of the spirit that has made created evolution possible. So um, the final word on Kagawa is definitely not, has not yet been written, but he, he was a synthetic thinker not an analytic thinker. He wanted to relate things to each other. This is not very good if you're doing a doctoral dissertation. I wouldn't recommend it. But if you are trying to change a society, and if you are trying to give witness to the God who became human in Jesus Christ, maybe seeing things as related um, 
more related than as um, more distinct. Uh, it's something we might think about. And finally, Kagawa's influence, as I mentioned at the beginning, goes far beyond the churches. And some of his greatest fans today are not in the churches. Now, how do you interpret that? Well, it's not easy. For different reasons, the churches were upset with this guy who moved into the slums and thought he could, you know, show the rest of us what to do, you know, how to live the, the Christian way. And, you know, so definitely from the church angle, Kagawa was an anomaly, an, an outlier. And he received funding directly. Well, the other churches had to go through the mission boards. That is not an insignificant difference. So, Kagawa's influence goes way beyond the churches into early childhood education. He was actually named by UNICEF as one of the 52, I think, uh, world leaders who did the most to protect the rights of children. This is in the 1990s, I believe. They work among the poor, medicine, financial, and ins insurance agencies and industries. There are several companies which f have their roots in Kagawa's work. Social movements, labor movement, agricultural movement, cooperative movement. Yes, Christianity and peace movement. Um, so I would like to stop there and thank you very much for your patience.